In this short video, we're going to talk about real vector spaces. Now, real vector spaces may have objects in them which don't look like what we call vectors. They don't look like vectors in Euclidean spaces, but they act like vectors in Euclidean spaces. So, think for a moment about differentiation. We learned in first semester calculus that the derivative of the sum is the sum of the derivatives. We also learn that we can factor out a, a constant from the derivative. So differentiation, the act of differentiation, possesses both the additivity property and the homogeneity property. So at least differentiation is acting like a linear transformation, or it has the essential properties of a linear transformation. But it doesn't act on vectors in Euclidean space. It acts on functions. Something similar happens with integration. You know that you can uh, integrate the sum of functions by integrating each function individually and then adding those integrals together. So the integral of the sum is the sum of the integrals. So integration has the additivity property. And you can factor out a multiplicative constant from a, an integral as well. So integration has the homogeneity property. So both differentiation and integration have these key ingredients to be considered linear transformations. But again, they're working on functions, not vectors in Rn. So in some sense, functions can act like vectors. Let's look at matrices, and in particular, let's revisit the transpose of a matrix. Remember that to get the transpose, you swap the rows and columns. There's an interchange. So the first, uh, your first row here becomes the first column of the transpose, and the first column of the matrix A becomes the first row of its transpose. Now, let's look at this idea of transposing matrices. If I have two matrices, and I'm going to choose them, they have to be the same size, but I chose them to be small, so it would be easy to write down. They have two rows and three columns. And if I form their transposes and add them together, I get the same matrix as if I first add them and then form the transpose. In other words, the transpose of the sum is the sum of the transposes. The transpose has the additivity property. Now let's just take a matrix and a scalar. Let's choose k equals 10. I could multiply the matrix by that scalar and then form the transpose. Or I could form the transpose and then multiply it by the scalar. In the end, I get the same matrix, which tells me that the transpose also has the homogeneity property. So we now have important properties of matrices. The first one is that you have additivity. The transpose of the sum is the sum of the transposes. And we also have homogeneity. And finally, something else that we're going to put in here it doesn't really uh, contribute to our discussion of real vector spaces, but it's a nice property to know about the transpose is that it undoes itself. Uh, if you take the transpose of the transpose, you get the same matrix back. And that should make sense, because the transpose really involves swapping, right? And just like we saw with elementary row operations, if you swap two rows, how do you undo that? You do the same swap, and it puts the rows back into their original position. And here's the same idea. If you've swapped the rows and the columns, and if you swap them back, well, now what was originally a row is back to being a row. What was originally a column is back to being a column. So a transpose operation acting on matrices 
acts very much or has the essential properties of being a linear transformation. But all of the linear transformations that we have studied up to now were transformations where the domain and the codomain were Euclidean spaces. Uh, if we were to say that the transpose is a linear transformation, the domain and the codomain would be a set of matrices, which is not Euclidean space. So the question is, can other sets of objects, like sets of functions or sets of matrices, do they have the same essential properties as R n? Can we do linear algebra with those sets? And well, to answer that question, we should pause for a moment and understand what is it about Euclidean space that makes it useful? What are its essential properties? And so there are 10 axioms, and we're going to break them up into four groups uh, to help us remember them better. So the first group has to do with uh, closure. So some notation here, the u, v, and w are vectors in uh, Rn, and R and S are scalars. So the first two properties are that uh, Rn is a subspace. It has the closure properties needed. You can't add your way out of Rn, and you can't scale your way out of Rn. The second group has to do with vector addition. Um, you have to have a commutative property of a addition and an associative property. The third group has to do with the zero vector and opposites. You have to have a zero vector defined, uh, and we know that we do. It's a vector of all whose components are all zeros. Uh, and the property of the zero vector, there's many of them, but the essential property is that if you add the zero vector to any vector, it doesn't change the other vector. And then you have to have an additive inverse, that's an opposite, so that when you add a vector to its opposite, you get the zero vector. And then the last group has to do with scalar multiplication. So you can distribute a vector across the sum of scalars, or a scalar across a sum of vectors. When it comes to scalar multiplication, if you're multiplying two or more scalars, the order in which you perform the multiplication doesn't matter. You get the same result. And then if you multiply by the scalar 1, the real number 1, that doesn't change the vector. And then finally, it's not one of our 10 axioms, but it's an important property that uh, the way we determine if vectors are parallel is we check if they're scalar multiples of each other. So let's check if our set of real m by n matrices acts like our end. Does it obey these axioms? And if so, we can treat these matrices as a different type of vector. They, you know, we could even think of them as being a vector that's been split across multiple columns or multiple rows. What would we think about as vector addition? Well, that would be our usual matrix addition. Scalar multiplication would still be the same way we multiply a scalar times a matrix. And the zero vector would be the matrix of all zeros. So if we look at this set that way, it should obey all of those axioms. Uh, it is a subspace. If you, ha if you have, remember, what's important is that these matrices all have the same number of rows and columns. And so if you add two m by n matrices, you're always going to get another m by n matrix. If you multiply one by a scalar, it's still an m by n matrix. So you can't add your way out, and you can't scale your way out of this set of matrices. Um, matrix addition is commutative, and it's associative.
the zero vector in this space would be considered the vector, I mean the matrix of all zeros. And so, uh, so the matrix of all zeros is the object, it's acting as the zero vector. So it gets a little bit big with the notation. You have the zero vector and then you have a subscript which has a subscript. But for now, we will work with it. And, but certainly if you add a matrix of all zeros to any other matrix, you get the same matrix back again. And then we could just take the opposite as being, well, just change all of the signs on the entries of A. And then if you add a matrix to its opposite, you get a matrix of all zeros. And then for scalar multiplication, sure, you can distribute a matrix across the sum of scalars. You can distribute a scalar across the sum of matrices. If you're multiplying more than one scalar times a matrix, uh, the order in which you perform the multiplication does not matter. And of course, if you multiply the real number one times a matrix, you get that matrix back again. So matrices are pretty easy to see that they obey these 10 axioms, but there's many other objects, uh, including functions or in general or more specific types of functions, like maybe polynomials of a specific degree or less, or maybe just specific sets of functions and their spans. Uh, they also act like Euclidean space Rn. Now, sometimes we have to be careful about how we define vector addition, scalar multiplication, and the zero vector. So, for to define a general real vector space, we need three things. We need a set of objects. And they could be matrices, they could be polynomials, more general functions, or just actually we'll see an example where we just let them be positive real numbers. Uh, no matter what, we always consider them or call them vectors even if the object is not a vector in uh, Euclidean space. We need a way to add them together. So we need a vector addition which obeys the uh, axioms for vector addition. And this is where it gets a little strange because in most cases, and when we're talking about matrices or functions, uh, we're going to be using what we would consider natural for that set of objects. Matrix, matrix addition, uh, adding two functions together, things that we've been doing for many years in mathematics. But in some cases we'll use something that's unusual or not intuitive and we're going to use a more generic symbol and it's just a plus sign within a circle. We'll call that O plus to represent vector addition, O plus. And also for scalar multiplication, almost always with the, the sets that we're going to be working with, the scalar multiplication is going to be defined as we would normally do with that set of objects. But sometimes it's defined in an unusual way. And in that case, instead of using a single dot, we're going to put a dot inside a circle, and I'm going to say O dot, O dot. So we have O plus and O dot. So we're going to put those three things together. So we've got a set of objects, we've got a vector addition, a scalar multiplication. Those are going to form a triple. Uh, so I'll have V, O plus, O dot. Those things together form a real vector space. So We've gone through these 10 axioms for Euclidean space and for matrices. Let's just go through them quickly again for our general real vector space. What do we need to have? Well, again, we're having vectors here. We don't know what these objects are. We're still writing them with just letters with an arrow above them. They could be, again, functions. They could be matrices. They could be other objects. Uh, and so, um, what do we need? Well, that you can't add your way out of the set, and you can't scale your way out of the set. You still need to have your vectors, or whatever objects they are, have a commutative addition and associative as well, a vector addition. You need to have a zero vector. So normally, that's one of the first things you need to think about if you're testing if a 
set of objects along with these operations will obey the axioms. Really, one of the first things you think about is, what is the zero vector? Uh, so you need to have a zero vector for that particular vector space, which obeys these axioms. And you need to have opposites as well. Uh, and then for scalar multiplication, you have to be able to distribute a vector across the sum of scalars, or a scalar across a sum of vectors. And again, if you're uh, multiplying more than one scalar times a vector, the order of scalar multiplication should not matter. And then the this one right here is always the real number one, the real scalar one. Uh, if you scale any vector by one, you get the same vector back again. And in our general real vector spaces, our notion of parallel stays the same. We'll have two vectors parallel to each other, uh, if and only if uh, they're a scalar multiples of each other. So we already saw that the uh, set of m by n matrices with the usual uh, addition and scalar multiplication forms a real vector space. Uh, polynomials, if you let Pn be the set of all polynomials of degree n or less. Remember, degree is the highest, is the exponent, the highest exponent uh, in the polynomial. So you could write it in this way. You have a coefficient a0 for the constant term. a1 is times x to the power of 1, a2 times x to the power of 2, all the way up to a n x to the power of n. All of the coefficients are real numbers. That would be a polynomial of degree n or less, because any of the coefficients could be 0. So if everything is 0 except for a1, I would just have p of x equals a1x. I'd have a polynomial of degree 1, but that's less than n. So that's OK. Again, here, how are we going to define our uh, vector addition? Vector addition is just the usual way we add uh, functions uh, or polynomials. Um, and usual multiplication by a constant. What would be the zero polynomial? Well, the zero polynomial would be a, the constant zero function. And so we use, we're going to reserve the letter z uh, for uh, this zero function. So z of x. So our zero vector in this vector space is the function z of x, which is identically zero for all values of x. Another way that we could define a real vector space is to look at function spaces, functions which are defined on a particular interval i. And i doesn't have to be a closed interval. It could be a half open interval, or it could be the entire real line. Uh, so an example of a function space would be looking at i as the closed interval from 0 to 1. All functions defined on the interval from 0 to 1 would form a vector space. And it would contain vectors like f of x equals 1 over 1 plus x squared, or g of x equals e to the x. And of course, it has to have a 0 vector, and that 0 vector would be the same z of x equals 0. Some vectors which would, I mean, not, not vectors, some functions which would not be in this space would be any function which is not defined for any value, even one value, between 0 and 1. So we couldn't have natural log of x. It's not defined when x equals 0. The same thing with uh, k of x equals 1 over x. It's defined for all values except for 0, but then it doesn't belong to this function space. And now here is what I'm calling the blow your mind vector space. Uh, this is really the first time that we have to use this O plus and O dot, because for our other vector spaces, we're using well-understood uh, polynom polynomial vector addition or addition of the objects 
and scalar multiplication. But here what we're going to do is we're going to define our set as the positive real number. So po a positive real number is now considered a vector, or the vectors in this space are real numbers. So we have two sets of real numbers that we're dealing with. Only the positive ones are considered vectors. For the scalars, we're still using all of the real numbers. The way that we're going to define vector addition, so remember that the vectors are actually numbers. The way that you add two vectors in this space is to form the usual scalar multiplication, so the scalar product. That will give me a new real positive real number, uh, and that's going to be a vector in our space. And uh, scalar multiplication. Scalar multiplication is going to be performed by taking a, the real number that is the scalar and putting it as the exponent of the positive real number, which we're treating as the vector. So this is exponentiation. Scalar multiplication in this uh, vector space is exponentiation. And the zero vector then, under this, these definitions of vector addition and scalar multiplication, the zero vector is the real number one. So I probably should have put a, an arrow over the one because I, I like to be consistent with putting arrows over real numbers, which we should con consider vectors. So for example, in this vector space, if I form the vector addition of 2 and 5, well, by the definition, that would be a scalar multiplication of 2 times 5. And then I would get 10 as a new vector. So the vector sum is of 2 and 5 is 10. If I take the negative 2, remember, this is a scalar now. It doesn't have an arrow over it. And it could be any real number. So if I take a negative 2 and scalar multiply that by the vector 5, I would take 5 raised to the power of negative 2, which would give me 1 over 25, which is another positive real number. So we can see that under this uh, uh, definition that you can't multiply your way out of the real number, positive real numbers, nor can you scale your way with this definition of scalar multiplication. And uh, again, our zero vector is actually the number 1. So if I take 1 times 5, I get 5, and that gives me the same number back again. Uh, what would be opposites? Well, opposites would be reciprocals. If I took a positive number, any positive number has a reciprocal. So if I were to take 7 and multiply it times 1 over 7, uh, I get 1. So if I multiplying in this scalar multiplication means vector addition. So if I vector addition or vector add, if I O plus 7, O plus 1 over 7 in this vector space gives me 1, which is the 0 vector. So opposites are reciprocals. So let's look at some examples. We'll finish the video here. Looking at these examples, which are not vector spaces. And in order to get something that's not a vector space, if we're dealing with objects which are in a Euclidean space, then we have to redefine either scalar multiplication or vector addition or both. And so we're going to redefine vector addition is that these are vectors in R2. The second component, the definition is what we normally do. We just add the components, y1 plus y2. With the first component, what we're going to do is we're going to add them and then multiply the, the sum by 2. That's the way you can think of it. Or you could think of it as being, I'm going to double each component and then add them together. Either way, this is not a, a vector space due to this redefinition of uh, vector addition. So what axioms are going to fail? Well, clearly, the way that what we've done is we haven't 
change the objects in R2. Um, we've redefined the scalar multiplication. So R2 is still a subspace. Even with this new definition, you cannot add your way out of R2. The, out, the output from this scalar, I'm sorry, this vector addition is still another vector in R2. And we didn't change scalar multiplication at all. So we know that it's, it's not going to be the first two axioms. Well, what about the next group, which has to do with vector addition? Let's check the first one, which is commutative property. Does the order in which we add two vectors matter with this new definition of vector addition? And so if I just write out the components for two generic vectors, u and v, and I form their, their sum using this new definition, and let me change the order then. Uh, if I change the order, well, then because really everything that's involved here is scalar multiplication and addition, the order in which I perform that doesn't matter. So 2u1 plus 2v1 is the same as 2v1 plus 2u1. So that particular axiom does not fail. But what about the associative property? Does the order, if I am going to add three vectors together, does the order in which I add them matter? Well, let's check it out. All right, let's start here by taking u and adding it to the sum of v and w. So we're going to do the sum v plus w first. So uh, in the first components, I have to multiply 2v1 and then add that to 2w1. Now I'm going to use the, our same vector addition to add that to the vector u1, 2, 1. So I'll need to multiply the first component in each vector by 2. Now, the first component in the second vector is the sum of 2v1 and 2w1. So that whole group needs to be multiplied by 2. And when I do that, I get 2u1 plus 4v1 plus 4w1. And the second component is, is exactly what we would expect. We didn't change that in our definition. All right, let's move the parentheses around. Let's perform the u plus v first, and then add that to w. So when I add u plus v, I have to multiply the first components by 2 before adding them. And then I'm going to take that sum, that vector sum, and add it to the vector w, which means, again, the first components have to get multiplied by 2. So again, I'll have this as a group. The 2u1 plus 2v2 has to get multiplied by 2. Well, after I remove the parentheses, look what I have. I have 4u1 instead of 2u1. I still have 4v1, but now I have 2w1 instead of 4w1. So I get a different answer depending upon the grouping. Which of the two vectors do I add first? So the distributive property, I'm sorry, the associative property fails. So in this set, if you use this particular definition of uh, vector addition, it, it's not a vector space. So let's look at our matrix space, which we know with our usual scalar multiplication. The usual scalar multiplication means you would distribute the scalar multiplication across all of the entries. What we're going to do is only distribute the multiplication across the first row. This is not a vector space. It must fail one of those 10 axioms. Since we've redefined only scalar multiplication, so the matrix addition did not change, that definition did not change, then let's focus on the axioms which deal with scalar uh, multiplication. So the first one is, can you distribute a matrix across the sum of scalars using this new way of defining scalar multiplication. Well, let's just go ahead and check. 
we're going to look at the left hand side first. We're just going to keep r plus s as a sum. And so with our new definition, the r plus s is only multiplied by the entries in the first row. Now let's look at the right hand side. So I'm going to first just take r with our new scalar multiplication, multiply that times a. We'll take s, multiply it times a, and then we'll use the usual matrix addition. We didn't redefine this. I put an O plus here, but really I could just use regular plus. And so when I multiply r times a, I'm only multiplying the first rows, the first row by r, or the first row entries by r. And then when I multiply s times the a, only the first row of a gets multiplied by s. But now I perform the usual uh, addition. And with the usual addition, I just add the corresponding entries. So in the first row, everything looks good because I'll just factor out the common factor of a11, a12, a13. Looks like the same first row I got up here. But I'm adding a21 to itself. So I'll get 2a21, 2a22, 2a23. So this very first distributive property fails for scalar multiplication. And so this is not a vector space. So for our more common vector spaces, vector spaces consisting of matrices, or polynomials or functions, we're going to see that we can do the linear algebra that we already do with Euclidean spaces. And we'll start in our next video.